Hello, and welcome to the latest Kula Partners webinar, 20 Considerations for Creating High-Performing International Manufacturer Websites. I'm your host, Jeff White. I'm one of the principals here at Kula Partners, and I've been designing and developing for the web since about 1993. What we're going to talk about today are problems that we typically see with manufacturer sites, things that make these manufacturing sites different, such as B2B e-commerce or dealer and distributor models. Manufacturer websites, perhaps more than any other industry site, serve as a really important piece of your buyer's journey. No one has a better understanding and is a better authority on the brand of products that you sell than the company that makes them. So the other contributing factor is that manufacturers often have multiple sites that have different tech stacks. This is occasionally as a result of growth via acquisition, and that combined with the multilingual requirements and some of the things that I mentioned earlier makes managing these sorts of network of sites particularly challenging. So without further ado, let's begin. I'm going to start by talking about interface design and navigation and wayfinding through the site. One of the things that can be very difficult, um, especially for larger manufacturers to deal with, is being able to categorize products by the name or category of that product as opposed to just something generic such as products or industries. And the reason that you want to be able to get to a place where you can have navigation that utilizes a, a category name or a product or brand name is that that particular word or set of keywords has much more significance from a search engine optimization perspective. It's much better for people to be able to quickly scan the site and see the kinds of things that they're looking for rather than having to drill down multiple levels. We know that Google places more importance on items that are further up the navigation tree. So whatever you can do to kind of categorize things in ways that are more product oriented as opposed to generic categories of type of thing, the better off you're going to be. Another important element here is the total number of categories that you have in your main navigation. You'll notice that on most sites, they don't exceed more than six or seven items. And there's a reason for that, because after you've read more than seven things, you tend to forget what the first one was, and then you have to rescan and it slows people down. So whenever possible, try and keep the number of navigation items under seven. It's actually part of the reason why North American phone numbers, for example, are only seven digits along with an area code. It's easier to remember that way. Another component of interface design and um, general kind of usability is the loading speed of the components on the page. We know from current research that even so much as a one second delay can reduce conversion by 7%. Amazon has noted that the longer it takes a page to load, the less likely people are to make a purchase. And anything that you can do to increase the loading speed, especially as an international manufacturer by using a CDN or caching network throughout the world so that your sites serve equally fast in Europe as they do in North America, can be incredibly important. Of course, the level of complexity of this kind of thing really varies quite a bit by the uh, overall architecture of your site network, but it is something that you should consider. One of the things that we see frequently, uh, not just with manufacturer sites, but with everything, is the desire to have a homepage carousel, a slider at the top of the page above the fold that showcases a number of different categories of product. And the thing is, is that usually someone in every department wants to have something visible above the fold. But in truthfulness, you have to curate this area. We have found through uh, various A-B testing and, and other types of usability tests that generally speaking, only the first slide receives any actual conversion attention and then people have moved on to the next thing. So whenever possible, try and avoid using carousels. They just don't work. And instead look at categorizing and utilizing the whole page. We know that everybody scrolls now on the internet, especially with touch devices, that myth that people don't really isn't true. So anything that you can do to begin to categorize your projects or products, curate them to the top of the page, and ensure that you have a single call to action that people can interact with are going to be one of the most important ways that you can drive people to the things that you want them to do. 
And of course, we remiss if we didn't talk about the importance of mobile. You know, we know that the vast majority of our clients see at least 30% adoption and use of their site via mobile devices globally and across all industries. That number is, has crested over 50%. In some cases, we're seeing 57% of uh, site visitors visiting on mobile. So if you're not optimizing your site for loading speed, for optimization of readability and for utilization of things like e-commerce and things like that directly on a mobile device, you may be missing out on a significant portion of your market. Website accessibility is something that not everybody thinks about at first blush and oftentimes as we're looking at a site design having a, a very nuanced and uh, an interesting looking design sometimes can be problematic for people with low vision or other disabilities who are using assistive technologies. So there are a series of guidelines called the WCAG or YCAG guidelines that deal with things such as contrast. You'll note here as we move to this next slide, just simply punching up the contrast so that it's at least 30% between the foreground and background elements can seriously assist people in accessing that content who may have low vision or another disability. Another thing that you want to be sure that you have are alt tags that truly describe what is in a piece of rich media, such as a photo. Um, transcripts for videos are also very important. And, you know, this is becoming not just a, a design consideration in order to accommodate people with disabilities, but in the U.S. there have actually been numerous lawsuits um, brought against corporations that are not making their site accessible to people. So anything that you can do to avoid these Section 508 lawsuits is probably a good idea, and it's good business anyway. I'm going to move on now and talk a bit about multiple languages and international content. We know with a lot of the manufacturers that we're working with that they have sites that are available in English, they're available in French, Spanish, German, and especially Chinese and Cantonese and other Asian languages. This generally creates a site architecture that is much more difficult to maintain. Translation can be expensive, but I think philosophically, the idea of having your site available completely in the language where your target demographic is actually purchasing from is essential, not only from a localized search perspective, but also just from the ability for them to use the site without becoming frustrated. For example, if you have a page for a product description that is in English and somebody lands there via a search engine and then tries to switch to German but that page isn't available, you can imagine how frustrating that might be. When it comes down to consolidating sites with multiple languages and often with multiple domain names in, in uh, different areas of the world, you know, our stance is that generally it's better to try and bring those sites together into a single uniform site and wherever possible, translate as much of that content as you can to ensure that it's available to everybody who wants to access it. Of course, when you're talking about content and conversion, one of the number one things that you can do in order to turn random site visitors into people that you know and are able to market to is to offer inbound calls to action as high up on the page as possible. These should be designed around your buyer personas to ensure that you're creating content that addresses the concerns and questions that people have. You should be able to capture that with just a name and email address and then use progressive profiling as people move further down the funnel. It makes a ton of sense to have only one of those available at any given time so that there's a lot of clarity in terms of what you want the visitor to do next. And that makes um, great sense to have that as a very uh, a feature that stands out on the page and is aligned with the content of that page. So if somebody is looking at a particular product of yours, you might have the buyer's guide to that category of products available for as a download that brings people into the top of your funnel and allows you to nurture and market to them until they've made a decision. Anything that you can do to help them out is going to be of a great value. 
smart content takes that to the next level. Somebody who comes in to the top of your funnel and nameless, faceless visitor to your site and gives your name and email address, moves down to the next phase, the middle of funnel. The next time they come back to the site, instead of offering them the exact same piece of top of funnel content, why not consider offering them a case study that is relevant to the product that they're looking and interested in? So as somebody moves through that funnel, you can utilize tools for marketing automation platforms such as HubSpot and others to offer completely different areas within that call to action or completely different content rather within that call to action area on your site. So as they move down to bottom of funnel, you might replace that case study with a contact form for sales or the ability to book a meeting with your sales team. Anything that you can do to contextualize the user's experience is going to yield maximum benefit. Manufacturers are particularly <clears throat> interesting in terms of uh, site architecture in that many manufacturers have dealer and distributor networks and utilizing a dealer and distributor locator is one of the most powerful top of funnel conversion assets that you can have. So allowing people to locate the nearest or most relevant dealer that is closest to them is an essential way to move them into the funnel and get them into your universe. One of the things that you, that we also do frequently, once we know exactly what dealer is most pertinent to that particular buyer, is any top of funnel conversion or other types of conversion, whether that's on an interactive calculator or something like that, we can funnel those leads to the specific dealer and utilize a dealer portal to ensure that the leads are being actioned appropriately by your sales team and your dealers and distributors. So this is a, a really essential piece of many manufacturer sites is having a locator for dealers and distributors. As we move into content and search considerations, on-page SEO is one of the most important categories in terms of when you're building a site and as you're making changes that are going to impact the overall top of funnel traffic and organic traffic that you're going to have to the site. You'll see a number of different items on this page, the relevant title tag at the very top of the page. This is the thing that Google actually uses in the search listing, the, the SERP, a search engine results page, as the title of that particular page, so you want that to have the keywords for the things that people might be looking for when they're looking for the content that you have to offer. You should not be leading with brand. The title tag on the homepage should not be home. It should not be welcome. It should be the category of products that you make and then the name and potentially the location if it's a um, dealer or distributor page. Following that, the product heading or H1 tag that is on that page is the second most important piece from an on-site SEO consideration. It should be relatively consistent with that title tag and use those prominent keywords so that when people scan it and search engines look at it, they know exactly what that page is going to be about. And further to our comments earlier about navigation, those category names of products should also be part of your main nav whenever possible. This isn't always possible, especially with large manufacturers with a diverse array of products, but it is very important to do. Duplicate content is an interesting issue because although we often talk about the duplicate content penalty that, uh, that can be levied by Google, this isn't actually the case. What generally happens is that content that is consistent and the same across multiple URLs, even if it's coming from the same company, Google doesn't necessarily know exactly which one of those pieces of content is the true authority and should be looked to as the, the most important answer to the question when somebody searches for one of those things. So what you can do in order to alleviate that is if you must duplicate content across multiple pages, and it should be the case that you're not doing that whenever possible, that you can use something called a canonical link in the code of that page that says, although this page uses content that is duplicated from another area of the site, the most important version and the de facto version of this content exists at this URL. And that's how you deal with duplicate content. Having content across multiple domains doesn't necessarily mean that Google will penalize you, as I was mentioning a moment ago, but it can create serious user confusion. 
So it's something to consider, especially as you're moving through and considering a content architecture exercise and when you're uh, amalgamating multiple sites. Because especially if you run multiple country sites or multiple language sites, you can have, for example, an English version of the site that is UK English, an American English version, and then a Canadian English version, and they all use the same content, but Google doesn't know which one is the most important and why. So if you integrate your site and instead focus the the multilingual areas of the site, instead of being on country but on language, you can boil it down to having a single version of a particular piece of content. As you're moving through and trying to understand what's actually going on in your Google Analytics package or other types of analytics that you might be using, some of the things that you want to be looking for, especially as you're evaluating how to merge and consolidate multiple sites, is what are the pages that Google considers a landing page? In other words, an entry page that people have used to find your site and how they got into the site content overall. This is essential. In, to ensure that as you begin to migrate and, and move a site into a new platform that you maintain any URLs for uh, landing pages that are particularly important, especially to search. And if you do need to change them, that you use a 301 redirect to put them in the appropriate place. You can view this by country so that you have a sense of how people are finding you internationally. For example, what's important to the people searching for you in China versus what's important for the people searching for you in Belgium or the US. They can be very different things and you will need to be able to optimize those in different ways in order to get the most value out of the content that you're creating. You should also be looking at um, the percentage of viewers that you have coming into your site from mobile, how long pages are taking, how long people are actually spending on those pages once they arrive, and what are the, you know, what are the kind of important pieces of content and what are the pieces of content that maybe aren't getting viewed. And it will give you the ability to understand why and make changes to the site that will be based on how users are currently using it now and how you can improve it going forward. As you merge multiple sites into one, it becomes extremely important to use um, a, or to develop a good understanding, as I was mentioning, what are those core landing pages across the different sites, creating the 301 redirects and building a spreadsheet that shows you exactly what content you're going to be pulling from which area and how you're going to display that, and then utilizing your analytics going forward so that you can gain an understanding of exactly how successful those changes might have been. You're going to want to look at the language issues, you're going to want to have a good understanding of the overall architecture of the site so that you can develop a navigation that is user friendly and uh, contributes to a positive user experience by uh, the people who are on your site. Going to look now at international e-commerce. Um, I know that many manufacturers actually have uh, e-commerce platforms that may only be available in one country or another. Usually they might have an e-commerce platform that works in the U.S., but it doesn't exist in China. Um, this is important because e-commerce pages and the product category pages are often some of the most important long tail search words that people are using to find you. So they're searching for a, a SKU number, they're searching for a model number, they're searching for a particular product name. And when they find it, oftentimes those e-commerce pages are the, the single most important landing pages that people are using to find the content on your site. So it can be frustrating when they arrive there and they see an add to cart button and they try to go through the process only to find out that the store isn't available where they are. So ensure that if you're building this kind of site that there are notes somewhere on the site or using code to geolocate somebody and geotag them so that they're not seeing things that they can't do when they arrive there. And that will help to um, decrease frustration and also allows you an opportunity to utilize other types of calls to action, such as contact a salesperson or get a quote or um, download a, a top of funnel guide to that particular product instead of purchasing it online if that's not available to them. 
The other thing that's very important is if you do have international e-commerce, that you're appropriately calculating shipping and taxes and things like that to ensure that you're properly dealing with um, all the uh, important things to, uh, to the users that are trying to make purchases on your site. As you're optimizing that checkout process, you want to ensure that you're making this as simple as possible and reducing the number of steps wherever you can. You also want to ensure, especially with uh, B2B transactions, oftentimes there are multiple shipping addresses, different billing addresses, and anything that you can do to optimize that process and ensure that people are able to actually complete that process as simply and effectively as possible is going to increase the number of purchases that you actually have on online. If somebody doesn't make it through to all the way to the end of a purchase, try and make sure that you're capturing their email address early on in that process of, of shipping or of making a purchase online so that if something goes wrong and they decide not to, you can use automated email nurturing and other forms of um, communication in order to try and nurture those people through to a close. Maybe they just ran into a problem. Maybe something wouldn't load. But there's a lot of there's a lot that can be said for giving them a second opportunity to actually complete their transaction and their purchase. And there's there's usually gold in them their hills. When you're talking about e-commerce in China, there's a number of different rules that need to be followed. You need to have an ICP number um, in order to even have a site that is in China. If you're going to be doing e-commerce, the server itself needs to be hosted in China. Um, you can't simply have a CDN that redirects from an American server into China in order to be able to access that market. You need to have the server in situ in China itself. Um, this can be cumbersome and, and a bit difficult, but there are partners that can be worked with in China that will help to stand up that site. That's also very important from a findability and usability perspective, because there is a firewall that keeps out a lot of information and can render international sites extremely slow if they are not actually hosted in China itself. So anything that you can do if China is an important target market for you in order to be able to optimize that experience is going to help to improve um, any e-commerce operation that you might have going in China itself. In terms of technology stack and international domains, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the importance of redirection and use of translation and alternate languages across a number of different sites. You're going to want to take those international domains and generally redirect them to your core main site and to a subsection or sub language of that site. You can use geolocation to do this in order to make assumptions and changes to the content as people are arriving at the site so that they're going into the most appropriate area or throwing up a pop-up if you must in order to allow people to choose the language that is most important to them as they enter. Um, this is essential in terms of that loading speed component that we talked about earlier, as well as having the native language of the people who are visiting your site available to them so that they can make um, choices according to the content that is available to them in their native tongue. Content management systems are, are one of those things that used to be incredibly um, cumbersome in terms of making a choice and especially with large international manufacturers many um, utilize enterprise level e-commerce systems or uh, content management systems and the trouble with these platforms is that they tend to be very cumbersome very difficult to use and not particularly interoperable with ERP systems, outside e-commerce platforms, translation engines, and, and other things like that. So it's important to know that even though WordPress began as a blogging platform, it is very capable and extensible um, in terms of creating an enterprise level content management system. And because it powers such a significant part of the web, it also is frequently updated. So ensure that anybody that you're working with, especially if they're going to be deploying an open source content management system, that they're doing frequent updates for you to ensure that the site remains secure. But in this day and age, it's not essential to use an enterprise level content management system, even if you are an enterprise level 
company. Marketing automation platforms are absolutely table stakes in this day and age in terms of having a platform that allows you to effectively convert and nurture your prospects and leads into customers. And it also allows you to scale a smaller marketing team to appear as if it's larger. If you have workflows and nurturing funnels set up, this can allow your team to, uh, to scale itself beyond small numbers and become a, a much more powerful and useful force in terms of tracking your users as they go through your system and uh, begin to close as customers. Of course, integrations between different components of your site are, are incredibly important, especially within a manufacturing space. We're constantly working with manufacturers to integrate CRMs, ERP systems, point of sale in some cases, and other types of integrations. So whatever you do choose for that content management platform, ensure that it has the capability to be extended beyond just the content management platform and ensure that any system that you're choosing from an ERP perspective or from a CRM perspective is web-based uh, SaaS product if possible with available APIs, application programming interfaces so that it can be easily connected from one platform to another so that when a lead converts on the site, they're sent to your marketing automation platform, to your CRM, and then when they actually convert and make a purchase that that is sent via your e-commerce system to your marketing automation platform so they can be closed as a customer and down to the ERP system so that they can be dealt with from a shipping and receiving type perspective. So in terms of key takeaways from this presentation, I hope you found it useful. You want to make your navigation as action oriented as possible for your key buyer personas and ensuring that that content is relevant and search friendly. If you're serving non-English speaking countries, you should get serious or think about getting serious about providing content in their native language. It may not be enough to simply translate a landing page or two for these users in order to be able to provide them with the optimal experience. And you may be missing out on potential search quality terms in those different countries because you haven't optimized the site in multiple languages. When you're merging multiple web properties, take a content audit approach and use appropriate redirection 301 redirects to maintain any search value that you already may have you don't want to lose that when you migrate to a new site and to ensure the interoperability of your tech stack you want to choose platforms with strong apis that allow you to make easy connections between the different systems so that you're not hamstrung by not being able to send your marketing automation leads into your CRM so your sales team can work them or vice versa. So look for platforms that actually will help you extend and scale your team rather than hold you back. So thanks again for joining me. Again, my name is Jeff White. You can find us at coolapartners.com. If you'd like to learn more about uh, website redesign, you can download our website redesign guide for manufacturers right now by clicking here. Um, this is a 50 plus page guide that deals with all elements of rebuilding and redesigning a uh, manufacturer website platform. And we've used this similar process to deploy hundreds of websites for many, many different customers. So I hope we find that useful. And uh, thanks very much for joining us.